Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. And in this video, we're going to be looking at Chapter 4, Early Childhood. The first section that we're going to take a look at is about physical development in early childhood. And we got several uh, learning objectives here. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is growth patterns. And what it is is that growth rate, uh, babies grow very quickly. Uh, growth rate slows down during the uh, preschool years. Now, boys and girls tend to grow two or three inches per year and also gain about four to six pounds per year. Now, they become, uh, they get taller, they gain height, shed some baby fat, so they actually become a little uh, skinnier, a little more slender as they uh as they grow up. Also, brain growth. The brain develops more quickly than any other organ during these years. So by the age of five, the brain has reached 90% of its adult weight and, you know, nothing else in the body is anywhere close to that uh, percentage. So by five, the brain's 90% of its adult weight. And the brain growth is due in part to this continuing process of myelination. That's putting the myelin uh, sheathing, the fat sheathing on the ax. Uh, on the axons of the neurons. So this myelination uh, links also the cerebellum to the cerebral cortex, and this facilitates the development of fine motor skills and balance and coordination. Also, um, you get a lot of growth in visual skills. So brain development improves the processing of visual information and it facilitates reading. So the parts of the brain that enable a child to sustain attention and screen out distractions, those become increasingly myelinated and better able to function between the ages of four and seven. Now we can look a little bit about uh, really what's called hemisphericity or the lateralization of brain function. And the idea here is that some research has suggested that the that uh, some functions of the brain are more likely to occur in one of the hemispheres, one of the halves of the brain, than the others. Now, don't make too much of this because it's not true that people are either left brain or right brain. People use both. Um, and the functions of the two hemispheres overlap. They, they respond simultaneously when we focus on one thing or another. So with that in mind, I'll just say that research suggests that the presence of some specialized functions uh, for each hemisphere of the brain. So for instance, the left hemisphere, which by the way is associated with the right side of the body because you have what's called cross-lateral connections, the, less hem the left hemisphere is more involved in things like logical analysis and problem solving as well as language and computation. The right hemisphere on the other hand, which is associated with the left side of the body, uh, shows some superiority in what's called visuospatial functions, as well as aesthetic and emotional responses, and things like uh, understanding metaphors. So you actually see that there are tasks that work on both. Um, and again, there are some differences in lateralization. Men tend to have a little more uneven lateralization. Things tend to be more on one side um, than another as compared to women, and also um, people who are left-handed. Uh, have uh, less lateralization, things are distributed a little more evenly. Um, let's take a quick look at growth patterns here. Now this this really kind of amazing uh, scan you're looking at here is a uh, coronal section of a person who has had half of their brain removed. Um, it's called a hemispherectomy and it's something that can happen in cases of extraordinary um, epilepsy for instance where one side of the brain is just totally misfiring all the time. And the funny thing about this is if you do this young enough, um, the, the brain shows plasticity. That's the ability to compensate for injuries, or in this case, surgical, uh, to particular areas. Now, plasticity, or the ability to recover from these things, is greatest at one to two years of age, so when you're very young, um, and gradually declines. And the things that enable plasticity, uh, those include things like the growth of new dendrites. Those are the ends of, uh, those are the parts of the cell that receive signals from other cells, uh, nerve cells, and also the redundancy of neural connections. So actually you'll have the same connection will be wired in more than one way. Anyhow, um, the, the, you are able to grow new neurons and things can rewire it. it obviously it happens fastest uh, faster when you're younger, but even extraordinary things like getting half of the um, cerebral cortex removed can still be overcome. Okay, now let's take a quick look at motor development. Now, uh, it helps here to talk about gross motor skills, fine motor skills. Now, older preschoolers 
are better able to coordinate two tasks, such as singing and running, at the same time. And in general, they, they appear to acquire motor skills by teaching themselves and also by observing other children. And you find there are some gender differences, but the individual differences are much, much larger than the group differences. So that being said, girls as a group are slightly better at things like balance and precision, while boys as a group um, are slightly better at things like throwing and kicking, which, um, you know, I guess should sound familiar. Also, motor activity levels begin to decline after two or three years of age, because up to that point, children move around a lot. And if children are also, when they're very young, they're very restless and unable to sit still. And when they hit two or three years of age, they're, they're better able to do those things, so they don't move quite as much. They also show an increase in sustained focused attention. Also, what is called rough and tumble play, uh, which is more common among boys, but certainly not exclusive to boys, that develops physical and social skills. And what I need to differentiate, you know, the rough and tumble play involves chasing each other around. Mine involves some hitting, but you, you can tell the kids are generally having fun. Um, this is different from bullying or fighting, which are, which are real problems. Also, let's just mention that physically active parents, surprisingly, are likely to have physically active children. Uh, how about a little bit more about motor development? Here we talk about fine motor skills. These are the skills that involve the small muscles that are used in manipulation and coordination. Now, these skills develop gradually. Uh, they develop more slowly than gross motor skills. So these skills enable children to, for instance, to hold a pencil, uh, hold it properly, to be able to dress themselves, do the buttons and tie their shoes, and to do things like stacking blocks. Um, in drawing, you see that the development of drawing, which is what we have right here, is linked to the development of motor and cognitive skills. Children generally progress through four stages, from making scribbles on the very left, which is what we see, and you see, uh, to get to a more um, advanced drawing, you have, they work on things about like the placement of objects, drawing the shapes, designing the elements by combining or aggregating them, and actually getting to what we call the pictorial stage, where things actually look like uh, what they're drawing. Next, uh, an interesting thing about handedness. Here we have a left-handed girl drawing, unless the... And uh, handedness becomes more strongly established during early childhood. Now, most children, not surprisingly, are right-handed. And it's not totally clear um, about how many are left-handed. It varies from study to study. But, you know, you might say approximately 10%, maybe. Um, now, being left-handed has some advantages and disadvantages. So, uh, what you see... Uh, when you look at people, is that a disproportionately high percentage of kids who do very well, a 12 and 13 year old kids who do very well on the math part of the SAT. Mind you, the SAT is designed for 17 and 18 year olds, but you get some kids who at 12 or 13 do very well on the math uh, part of the SAT. There's a higher percentage of left-handed people who do well on that than you would expect. Also, people who are left-handed uh, often show more talent in various sports and fine arts. For instance, um, we see that uh, handball, uh, people who are left-handed generally uh, have s often have an advantage in fencing, uh, boxing, basketball, and baseball. Now, baseball makes sense. Baseball is a left-handed uh, sport, essentially. But a lot of the other ones, it, I wonder to what extent it has to do with the fact that you're playing against right-handed people, which might facilitate certain things. But anyhow, um, but when you see that there's a math advantage, you wonder if there's some more going on with it. Now, on the other hand, there are some problems associated with people who are left-handed. So, for instance, people who are left-handed are more likely to experience language problems, certain kinds of health problems, as well as uh, links to some psychological disorders, such as schizophrenia or depression. Now, about nutrition. In early childhood... Uh, parents need to notice, well, they may notice that a child's appetite decreases, becomes more erratic as the child needs fewer calories. So previous to that, kind of basically eat a lot and eat anything. And it can, at this point in early childhood, children can develop strong and sometimes strange preferences for certain foods. So they get these uh, both aversions and preferences. And they might, you know, consume uh, way too much sugar and way too much salt, which, of course, can be harmful to their health. Um, now, so parents who have small children are trying to develop, are trying to work with um, eating preferences and taste aversions, which I am definitely trying to deal with with my three kids. Um, one strategy that has been recommended 
Um, a little hard to do in real life, but one strategy is, is to give the kids just tiny amounts of the food that they don't like um, for eight to ten times. And the idea here is that the taste will become familiar to them, and then they might be more likely to come and like it or at least uh, tolerate it over time. Okay, about health and illness. Um, the first thing is that kids get sick a lot. So common minor illnesses, which could happen, um, you know, from one to three, it's 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 up to eight or nine times a year, and then it drops down to four or six, but it's still pretty often. Common minor illnesses during early childhood can include respiratory infections, gastrointestinal upsets, um, and then, but it becomes less common over time. Now, the major illnesses that affect children around... Uh, vary according to where you are in the world. Some illnesses uh, can be uh, very serious, deadly, um, especially where the resources to treat the illnesses or simply to prevent them are limited. So the most common major illnesses that can result in the death of a child include things like pneumonia and diarrhea, malaria and measles, and a whole host of things associated with malnutrition. On the other hand, um, and, other, and those are mostly going to be in countries that don't have a very well-developed uh, health care system or you know, public health as an issue. In other countries like the U.S., they're less susceptible to these, these, these diseases, but instead you have what are sometimes called the diseases of affluence. Um, so, for instance, kids in the United States don't often die of malaria, but they do die a lot in car accidents. In fact, car accidents are the number one uh, cause of death for children in the U.S., also, you get things like obesity and diabetes, uh, which are, as I think everybody knows, really rising very quickly at an alarming rate in the U.S. And these are diseases that you only get with people who have enough money to get a lot of food and get too much of the stuff that's not good for them. Finally, let's talk a little bit about sleep. Uh, preschoolers don't need as much sleep as infants. Remember, infants sleep a lot, uh, often over half the day. Um, most preschoolers... Uh, sleep 10 to 11 hours in a 24-hour period, and that might be 9 or 10 hours at night, and then a nap of 1 or 2 hours. Of course, many children resist going to bed or going to sleep. Now, uh, you can talk about sleep disorders. Um, common sleep disorders during these early childhood years can include what are called sleep terrors or night terrors, nightmares, and sleepwalking. So, the first one, sleep terrors or night terrors, these, these are a child wakes up suddenly. They've got this huge surge in heart and respiration. They talk incoherently. Their eyes may be open. They may get up and walk around, they're, and they thrash about, but they're not really aware of what's going on around them. Um, this is different from a nightmare. A nightmare is a bad dream that takes place during REM sleep, the rapid eye movement. Sleep terrors and night terrors, they take place during deep sleep, and so it's it's functionally very different. Also, kids who have sleep terrors or night terrors, they don't remember them when they wake up, and it's also very hard to wake them up. Um, now, about um, sleepwalking, technically known as somnambulism, um, when children sleepwalk, they can do things like arrange toys, go to the bathroom, hopefully in the bathroom, or they can go to the refrigerator, and what you find is that um, the incidence of sleepwalking uh, as well as sleep terrors, they become less likely as children, matru uh, as children mature, showing it has a lot to do with the biological maturation of the brain. And that's it for this section.